So thank you for coming in, Ben. We know you because, um, well, maybe you could tell us a little bit how we know who you are and, well, who you are and yeah, what you do. No <laughs> I used to come to this um, college, so I studied in about 2004 or five, and I did the music production course uh, yeah. and sound engineering course here back then. Okay, so right. So that was quite a while ago then. A while ago, man. So I imagine it's, it's changed a fair bit. Yeah, this wasn't around when, when you no, were no, here, right? No, it's changed a lot. Like the school's come on like, I mean, I thought it was amazing back then, but it's, um, yeah, it's come a long way. And I think the profile of the school as well, I hear about it all the time, you know, so. Brilliant. So, I mean, how did Point Blank help you in terms of, uh, you know, your career? And what, what did you end up doing once you, once you graduated, you finished your course? What was, what was you your know journey? What? I think before I came to Point Blank, I was, um, I knew I liked music. I didn't know I would do it as a career, but I was sort of at a point where, you know, you, you, I'd finished my GCSEs and I'd done, well, well I say I, I kind of attempted my A-levels and I kind of didn't get, I didn't do great in my A-levels, but I knew I liked music. Um, and as I said, I was already making, making beats, messing around. I was using a program called Reason. Um, but I just wanted to get, a bit more technical knowledge i guess and just and just feel like you know i had had some kind of formal training although i didn't know exactly what i wanted to go on and do i know i wanted to work in music so right i came here and i studied i studied the course um and you know what I, what i went on to do i would say you you couldn't understand how beneficial it was for me to come and study right you know and, and actually get get the technical knowledge and, and whatnot uh, and, and sort of be able to speak a different language in music, you know? Okay. Um, so, yeah, I went on to um, work at Universal Records as an A&R for 10 years. Um, so you, you were, uh, were you looking for work as a music producer or was it, you know? Yeah, so when I, all right, when I first left here, yeah. I, I, in fact, when I was here, I was, I was um, interning at um, a studio in Brixton called The Dairy. Um, and I was also working at like a, a, a live night, like a rap battle night that they used to do in the West End as well. So I was like doing that and just teaching a bit of DJ and messing around, just trying to make ends meet and just trying to figure out what it was that I wanted to do. I was meeting a lot of people and I wasn't sure if I wanted to be an engineer, if I wanted to uh, pursue the production side of things or if I wanted to work behind the scenes in in music and actually I've, I've ended up doing a multitude of all of those things actually but right. I guess primarily people would know me more for working behind the scenes at, at a record label or or being a manager of an artist now right um, so you, you went to Universal how, how did you get that job how did you land that job you know what that was I got a, an opportunity to work at Universal through um, someone that I that, that used to come down to the live night that I used to work at. So, you know, net, networking and meeting people was always massive for me. And I think not being afraid to tell people what you're trying to do. For ages, I would have it in my head, but I wasn't saying to anybody that I, I wanted to work in the music industry. But then as soon as I started saying that, people say, oh, you should meet this person, you should speak to that person, and da 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 So that's basically how it happened. And by the way, I sent off loads of CVs to, to record labels before, and I never got one reply. But as soon as I started talking to people about it, right. it's funny like what word of mouth can do. So I got an opportunity to go in there and do one month's work experience. And it was sort of the first um, proper job I'd ever really had, even though it was only work experience. But I knew as soon as I went into that building, I was just like, I was pretty blown away and I knew I, I needed to do everything I could to, to keep a job in there. Okay. And um, so, yeah. So what were some of the most sort of valuable skills you think you learned from your time there? How long were you at Universal for? I was there for 10 years. I started in 2006 right. and I left 2016. Okay. And so in what capacity were you sort of working for them? What, what were they making you do? And um, how did you go from being an intern and yeah. to, to 10 years? You know what? It's funny, but sometimes that when, you're, when you're just interning or you're working as an assistant, sometimes just doing very basic fundamental things, it sounds silly, but it's like just turn up on time or early, stay a bit late, just, just, do, just be extra helpful. Often in those assistant positions, especially when you're interning, it's sometimes hard for people to give you responsibility. It's like they know you're only here for a short time, and you know, but you just got to make yourself completely indispensable. Just... Re like just go above and beyond to be of help, you know, and it's not, it's not rocket science, it's just, it's just understanding how to maneuver in that kind of environment initially, I would say. Yeah. And, 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 you know, beyond that, you know, I guess starting to 
you know, pick up certain skills or understand which side of the business you want to go into. If you want to do marketing, if you want to do A&R, if you want to be a press person, if you want to go into publishing, you know. But yeah, I guess my, my initial start in Universal was just me getting to learn the industry. I didn't know that I wanted to necessarily be an A&R person um, right. at, that, at that point. Um, I knew that I liked being in the studio. I knew that I liked making records. I knew that I enjoyed that side of things. But, you know, I actually started in the marketing department and okay. I made my way. I was going to ask if you tried your hand at yeah, several different yeah. areas. Or yeah, I started in marketing. I was an assistant in the marketing department, which is a very central department in a record label. They speak to everybody from the A&Rs, where the creative music process starts, to the to the PR and the press people and, you know, are responsible for... All of that, and a very, very central person in a record label. So I got mm -hmm. to see, sort of see and learn what all the different departments did quite early on. Okay, so you eventually ended up in A and R. Yeah. Um, so how long were you doing the A and R stuff at Universal for? I got into the A and R department about a year after I started, so 2007. Okay. But again, just as an assistant. Um, so you sort of. You know, I was at that at that time anyway, copying a lot of CDs and writing out lyrics to records and um, doing all of the credits, like the credits that Ski had up here. You know, when we, we I would be working out who'd done the writing and who the publishers were and just putting that into like a system that they had. So doing all of that kind of stuff, which was sometimes kind of mundane, but also pretty interesting at the same time. Yeah. Um, and then in the evenings, I would be going out and like what they call scouting. So looking for new talent, basically, and just trying to learn what it was that they wanted, trying to learn what I could bring and where I could be of value and stuff like that. And that's kind of how that all started. Right. So any artists we might know that you uh, sort of helped bring to the forefront yeah, in that the time? the first artist that I personally ever signed and was responsible for was Tinchy Strider. So he was a rapper that was out like 10 years ago. Yeah. So he was the first act that I signed after. Wicked, yeah. I don't know. I think everyone knows yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, yeah, I worked with, I, I love rap music and black music and I've always like worked in that side of the business. So yeah, I worked with Tinchy, um, Devlin, um, a singer called Angel, um, a couple other bits and pieces. But yeah. I think w one of the best lessons that I got to learn and I was very lucky with my timing, I was assisting a guy called Darkus at that time and he, he had just, or was just making Back to Black, the Amy album. So I was fortunate to, be around him and get to ask him a lot of questions and right. be a bit of a fly on the wall through that kind of um that early sort of like process so. yeah and so what, what would you say an a and r sort of looks for in an artist what were your kind of attributes main attributes that you were kind of looking out for when going scouting for instance you know knowing who's going to be the next i'd say thing. do you know what i think my 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 opinion from then to now has changed a lot Right. In terms of like what, and I can't say what an A and R looks for. I can only say what I personally look for in okay. an artist. But I think, look, you know, somebody being somebody being musically talented is like a given. Like they obviously have to be above a threshold of talent, in your opinion. That goes without saying. I think beyond that, um, it, it's about that person's character, about their drive. Do they have a vision? Um, you know, are they are they just single-mindedly obsessed with where they're trying to get to? Because I think that that's actually like, it's a hard industry to crack. And there's a lot of really, really talented people that don't make it. And there's a lot of not as talented people that do make it because they've got great drive. Mm. And they do all of the other bits fantastically. And the talent is just not enough. So I think right. being able to uh, see somebody that has a vision for themselves, a vision that I can share and think I could help with is fundamental. Um, and yeah, just knowing that, that that person has the has the right mentality because it's a, as I said, it's a hard game. Yeah. Um, and and also like at this point in my life, like just thinking that I'm going to get along with this person because we're going to spend a lot of time together. Which might sound silly, but like you know, there's no point of even trying to do it if you just don't even get along with the person. You know, it's going to be it's going to be difficult. So yeah, absolutely. Mm. So you were I mean Universal for ten years, yeah. and then. You left, so what did you end up doing thereafter? Um, I always wanted to learn more about, just understand how to be a, a bit more of a businessman. I think as an A&R person in a major label, there are a lot of people around you that sort of do the deals and the contracts and you have to adhere, or I had to adhere to certain 
um, you know, protocols of the universal system, which was cool, but the business was really changing, you know, the, the rise of streaming, um, how much cheaper it was to make music, to make a video, to promote that music and um, distribute that music. It was like the costs of the business were like slashed massively. Yeah. And um, there was just a big rise in, 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 in people wanting to be independent and start their thing themselves and I and I was really I really wanted to know more about that I felt like I'd had good experience as in terms of making records with people in the studio but I didn't feel like I I had a great understanding of how to run a business and I just thought I you know if I if I stayed if I signed another contract there and stayed another three or four years then maybe I might miss the opportunity so I decided to to to, to leave and try and set up my own um like management um company and and record label with a great friend of mine, a guy called Jack Foster, who I've, he used to manage Tinchy, so I always knew him, and we'd always worked kind of closely together. Right. And we were managing a few producers at that time and looking for, looking for artists and um, came across a young 16-year-old kid from Streatham at the time called Dave. Uh, he was a young rapper. He had um, a couple of things up on YouTube. He had like a black box... Right. Um, and yeah, just a couple of, like an SBTV freestyle. And I just thought he was like incredible. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that was like the next chapter. Wicked. So I think uh, we've all maybe seen that uh, Glastonbury <laughs> set this summer. Were you yeah, there? When, yeah, uh, I was there. I was there. Yeah. When Dave brought up uh, this young man. Alex. Yeah. Alex, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was quite, quite a journey. And I take it through your contacts, you know, you've been able to help him get up to that that level as well as his talent obviously yeah i have to say like he 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 is all of the things that i just mentioned before about what you look for in an artist this guy has in abundance he made me question so much that i thought i knew about the music business and how to release records because on top of being like an incredible artist i just think he's like one of the brightest people that i'd ever met and yeah his 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 ambition was just incredible and he had a great understanding of like his fan base as well you got to think like um you know he was a he was a 16 17 year old trying to sell music to 16 and 17 year olds so mm. who better to understand how to do that than him you know yeah, and, and, and not 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 that it's going to work like that every time but i learned a lot from him and listening to him and you know asking myself why 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 would i do this a certain way other than out of habit you know but things things change and i think that that was really important for me you know so there's a kind of a adaptability yeah yeah 100 so i'm just saying that as much as i brought whatever i you know bring to the table for him he also he also brings so much you know? yeah um i mean what would, you, what would you say how important is a manager's role in this day and age um you know and particularly nowadays producers musicians they're doing it alone you know like uh -huh. You were at home in your studio producing. Yeah. You got to yeah. promote yourself. You got to market yourself. Um, when does a sort of a manager start getting involved in uh, in kind of an artist's career? Would you say? I think you know. It, again, it's different for every single artist. But I would say it is. D don't think that, on one hand, just finding a manager at any given time is going to necessarily help you get to where you're trying to get to. Um, it can, but I think. It's always important to understand what you're asking of a manager because you've probably or hopefully done some of it yourself already. You know, mm. um, I think it's kind of you kind of need a manager when you really, really need a manager, not right. just like because you think it's the done thing. Like I should just get a manager. Like that's not really how it works. And I think a manager is going to only be able to help you more if you have that understanding, that vision, and a bit of a bit of knowledge. You know. Um, in the first instance as to where you're trying to go. Like, okay. you know, making your first song and then looking for a manager probably isn't quite it. But I think there's, a, there's probably a happy medium between, you know, when, when you need to really just be able to focus on the creative aspect and have somebody handling the strategic aspect and the business aspect for you. But it is good to get that, f that foundation of knowledge yourself initially. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, I think there's a lot of students here today as well that might be interested in our music business courses yeah. and they might be interested in becoming managers themselves. What advice would you give to to those that were looking at, you know, later on representing future talent themselves? What advice would I give you? 
Um, hmm, it's a good question. What advice would I give you? I would say, you know, to, to, to be a manager, like you have to understand like you're in the service industry, like your artist is gonna call you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you gotta, you gotta be understanding of that, you know? And I think it's, um, you know, it takes, a, so it takes a certain type of person, you know, this, the job of managing artists is like, it's, it's great, it's amazing. It's very psychological as well though. Mm -hmm. um, when I say that, I mean just, you know, artists, and I'm sure there are artists in this room, and I'm sure, you know what, let me, let me, let me backtrack in fact. I think the business is quite, um, like you've got people that really work behind the scenes and then you've got the creatives, and most people either fall into one side or the other. But there is a slither of people that fall in the middle where you're sort of a conduit between the two. You know, you sort of, you can have those creative conversations with the artists and you can, you can also walk into the boardroom and have the more corporate conversations. And that is, that is uh, by definition, almost what an A&R person is. When you talk about management today, yep. I think management encompasses so many roles. I think management encompasses A&R. I think management encompasses an element of PR, especially early on as a young manager, because you're not going to be able to pay for a huge team. Mm. Um, you may be a videographer, you may be a lot of things, but you know, that, that position of sitting between the corporate world, the business world and the, and, and, and the creative is a very important role um, and it requires delicate handling, basically. Um, and I think you've got to understand that. Quite a diplomatic role. It is a yeah. diplomatic role. It is a diplomatic role. So, um, I mean, I guess to, to kind of finish off, is there anything exciting for you in the pipeline in terms of up and coming acts we should be watching out for? Who's, uh, who's next to, on the radar? Who is next on the radar? Ones that I'm working with or ones that I just... Well, yeah, I guess ones who, that who I just you're wrote. representing or maybe other people that you, you know, feel like... Um, do you know what? Yeah, there's a, couple of, there's, a couple of, there's a couple of artists that are coming through. Um, there's, a, there's a rapper from Manchester called Meeks Manny. He's a new guy that we're working with. Um, there's a young singer from Northwest London called Kamal. Incredible soul singer. But again, it's early. He's got a couple of bits up on Spotify, though. Right. Um, you know, a few bits and pieces. Yeah. yeah, cool. You heard it here first. Um, well, listen, I'd like to to open up uh, any questions to uh, to the room um, to Ben. Yeah, um, yeah. Does anyone have any questions that you might like to put to Ben? Yes, I wanted to ask you uh, because I'm an artist, yeah. and uh, sometimes I don't know where to go for networking for music, and I do a lot of show, but it's always the same show, and sometimes I want to go to the next level. But sometimes it's, that's my direction and sometimes it's difficult to find. So I don't know if you're going to... You know what, it, it's, I mean, yeah, I would, I would obviously just say like, yeah, shows, open mic nights, these kind of things. I, I'm not sure exactly where the hotspots are right now, but I'm sure even in this room, people are going to be able to tell you where they go, where they, where they visit, what happens every, every week. I think those things are important. Um, but yeah, I know that's not that maybe the best answer, but I think those are the, those are the like... Those are the best places to find new new contacts and stuff. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, guys, uh, for Ben? Yeah, come up to you, mate. Um, would you say in this day and age that marketing your music is more important than the actual music itself? No way. No. All right. <laughs> Anybody else? Is everyone back here? No? Um, so you did the, the production and sound engineering course, yeah. right? Yeah. Not the music industry one. No. So how... Like, what did that knowledge give you uh, in terms of how the industry works rather than how the artist works? You know, when, when I was asked that question here, I said it allowed me to sort of speak another language. And I think when I talked about that position of being between the business world and the creative world, you know, that gave me a foundation. And I still make music really more for a hobby to this day. But being able to go into a studio and have a conversation with a producer and taught from a point of understanding that, you know what, maybe that song is in the wrong key for that singer, or maybe we need to edit those eight bars out there, or maybe we need, I don't know, just being able to talk the language and, and actually have a constructive conversation, not based on an, an insane depth of knowledge, but just from a point of view of, okay, we, yeah, he gets it, like he knows what he's talking about, and you can actually have an on-level conversation, because, yeah, the, you know, as I said, the studio and those spaces. Sometimes if you're working in the business side, and I don't know if people are trying to go into the business side, but you can 
you know, the producers and the artists can feel quite like this is our space. Like, don't come in here and talk if you're not one of us, if you're like a suit, basically. If you're like, do you know what I mean? So it's like to be able to make them feel like, oh, no, he's musical. Like, he can relate. Like, that was really, really helpful and really beneficial for me. Um, I, can't, I can't tell you how much that has helped me. Um, and, and, and even on your own, guys, if anyone that's coming to study music production, just understand, just taking time in your own to understand some theory, just play a little bit. YouTube is your friend. Like, it will help you. I can't tell you how much it will help you. And I, I never started playing um, an instrument until I was about 16, 17. So a lot of people think, oh, it's too late. I don't play. I wish I could play, but, you know, so. You can always learn as You can time. always learn, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Any final questions for Ben? Yeah. What do you think the future of the music industry is going to be with a lot of artists now being DIY, music technology, rapid innovation? You've got social media where you can market your own content now. Where do you think future generations of artists are going to move towards? Yeah, I just, th I just think it's in the, I think that that is that is it's a good place. It's more, um, it's just a bit more. Uh, it's a bit fairer. There's more options. There's more choice. You know, I think I don't think major labels are going anywhere because I think. Um, that is necessary, that's a necessary machine for a lot of type of artists, but people just have more choice now, you know? Like, you don't have to just go the major label route and wait for one person to tell you, yeah, you're good to go, we'll put your record out. Like, you don't have to wait for that. And I think that's a, that's a good thing. It's made the majors have to work a lot harder. I think it will probably make them ultimately have to be a little fairer in the way that the deals are structured. I think the deals are pretty archaic in the way that they are, in the way that record label, record deals traditionally are structured. I think it's kind of, you know, I don't necessarily agree with, with a one sh sort of size fits all. And I'm not talking about advanced money, but just terms, life of copyright, things like that. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes I don't know. So I think that um, the fact that, yeah, the, 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 the business, there's, there's more, there's more uh, ways of being able to distribute your music is, is, is just good for the artist. I think it puts much more power back in the artist's hand, and that's how it should be. I don't think the, the business should be controlled by people at radio. So that's my opinion. Yeah. Um, I think we have time uh, for one more question. Um, any last ones? If not, yeah, you again. I'm coming. Do you think that um, in the future that UK music is going to be more mainstream than American music anytime soon? You know what? It's interesting because, uh, like, specifically, like, when it comes to rap, right? Like, there's, there's, there's kids now that have grown up and they've grown up listening to UK rap from as long as they could remember, which is not the same for my generation. You know, you had to discover UK rap after listening to a lot of American rap. And I think that that's an interesting position to be in. Um, I think like the world of streaming definitely like has knocked down a lot of the doors. I've seen it firsthand between, you know, 10 years ago, you could be the biggest artist or rapper anyway here and you couldn't play a show to 200 people in Paris, honestly. But now it's like things happen, happen more simultaneously. You know, you can go and play Europe, America, Australia and there's life there. And that's quite, that's quite incredible to see, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I, I, I hope that there is more balance between domestic UK music and everything else when you look at the when you look at the chart or the airplay. So, brilliant. Well, listen, Ben. Uh, thank you very much for coming in today um, and for talking with everybody, yeah, giving no. us a bit more of an insight you. into your career. Thank you, guys. Respect them.